You're listening to Got Tech, the podcast with your hosts, Eric Geis and Nick Johnson. Welcome back to Got Tech, the podcast. This is episode 29 called Fantasy Ed Tech Draft, 41 Tools for a Student-Centered Classroom. In this episode, Geis and Nick welcome Jeff Loesch for their first ever Fantasy Ed Tech Draft. Jeff is a teacher and tech coach, and he joins us as we each select seven ed tech tools from a pool of over 40 different websites, software, and extensions. Check out this unique episode as we try to put together the winning ed tech team. So Nick and I had a goal of bringing uh, new faces onto the podcast in our second year. Today is no different for episode 29. We have a colleague of ours, Jeff Loesch. So I guess I just want to welcome Jeff and say, what's up, Nick? Not much, guys. How's it going? It's uh, early in the morning. We're excited to be recording here with Jeff. Jeff, welcome. Welcome to the show. How are you doing this morning? I'm doing pretty well. Thanks for having me. So tell us a little bit about yourself, your your educational journey, and how you got to where you are now. I started teaching a little over 20 years ago at Montgomery High School. I was strictly a math teacher, taught pre-calculus and algebra one and everything in between. And then I moved over here to uh, Hopewell and started teaching math here for a little bit, taught some computer science some pre-engineering, some business courses, personal finance. And the last couple of years, I've been a technology coach half day and a personal finance coach the other half day. Awesome. So we're getting into it today. This is my favorite time of year. It is fantasy baseball season. Today, we're going to take a spin on our fantasy baseball drafts. And Nick is looking at me with absolutely the blankest stare like he's never heard of this before but we'll get into it we'll explain it we're going to do a spin off of a fantasy draft to make it an ed tech tool fantasy draft and we're going to base this on a student-centered approach or student-centered classroom so a little bit about a fantasy draft and uh jeff anytime you want to chime in you can because i know that you are the guru of fantasy so a fantasy draft and if you pick a sport like baseball there's nine positions on the field so what you would do is all the major league baseball rosters would come into one big drafting pool and you would have a bunch of managers like Nick you would be a manager Jeff would be a manager I would be a manager and there's usually seven to nine more so a 10 to 12 team league and what you do is you have to draft a player to fit each one of those nine major categories and then a couple extras as reserves so today what we're going to do is we're going to start by picking well we'll introduce the categories that we are going to pick tools from. And then we'll go over each category, the tools that we put in each category. And then we will kind of do a recap of the draft that we are going to do off air. So just because I guys mentioned a little bit, I've never done any kind of uh, fantasy sports draft before. It sounds like for us, we've chosen six categories. We'll get into those in a second, but the categories would be equivalent to in a real draft, the position that you're trying to fill on your pretend team is that correct yeah so pitcher okay. first base second base third base shortstop that type of thing and then the ed tech tools that we have selected as part of our draft those are essentially our, our players that we're then bringing to our our team or what would in this case be like our lesson or whatever we're kind of big picture thing we're trying to design that's 100 percent correct and before okay. you go over the categories i should mention a couple of the rules all right the first thing is everybody at this table jeff nick and i are all given g suite all Right. That does not include any extension, that does not include any add-on, and that does not include Google Classroom. But we all get docs, drawings, sheets, forms, all those. Okay, so we can all kind of rely on having Google Apps as like the basis or sort of like this given background for any of our other ed tech selections. That is correct. So over the course of the draft, we're going to be drafting tools from the six categories, and we picked... I think 40, 41 different uh, tools to go under the uh, six different categories. Right. We should also mention that as you're listening into our draft picks, uh, we have available all 41 of these tools for viewers to kind of check out in a recent post on the website. Is that correct? Yes. This this uh, post will go along with our podcast. So we'll release them both at the same time because on this podcast, we're going to go over each category and the ones that we selected underneath, but it's not in any particular order. We'll tell you when 
when we selected them. But if you want to see the actual selections in the order and all the descriptions of the tools, you'll have to go check out the post or go to the show notes. Right. And I think it might, if you are listening to this, it might be kind of an interesting angle, not only just to see all 41 of the text selections. <laughs> that I know guys put a lot of work into figuring out to kind of see all those things, but also to give a different spin on maybe which ones we chose to not select for this might be sort of a an interesting play on what's happening here with our uh, fantasy ed tech draft. I'd also like to point out that uh, guys did a great job of finding some tools that um, I know I hadn't heard of, so I had to do a little bit of extra research, and I think the listeners are going to um, find some some things that they may maybe haven't tried before, so I think it was really good to uh, not just go with the obvious ones. All right, so thanks for the shout out there, but Nick, let's go over the six categories. Sure. So here's the categories that we drafted our EdTech players into. The first one being a photo slash video. These are, of course, just apps, extensions, websites, really anything you could use to capture photographs, edit photographs, post them. And this also extends out to video. So video recording, screencast, webcams, video editing, uh, anything that falls within that category was the photo video selections. Next, we have gamification and assessment. That one's pretty obvious. Some of the tools we could choose from were just geared more towards assessment, uh, both formative and summative, but we also tried to get as many as possible that fall within the gamification category. So missions, challenges, points, bonuses, that type of thing, just to make it as interesting for the students as possible. Next, we have personalized learning and feedback. This is probably our most varied category. All of the things I would say mostly geared towards ways that you could collaboratively provide feedback feedback to the students in some way. The larger sense, of course, personalized learning, because if you're giving that feedback to students, they're getting their own personalized feedback from you. So some interesting selections there. Next, we have collaboration and curation. These are ways, of course, that teacher and students or students to students can collaborate with each other. The curation part is a big component that we sort of saw mixed in here was just gathering resources for students, sharing them out, and then being able to collaborate amongst those resources. The next category is class classroom management and environment. These are tech tools that really just help you build a positive classroom environment and help to manage that classroom effectively. And then lastly, we have productivity and creativity. These are ways to just sort of run your classroom smarter, faster, and sometimes be more creative as you do that. So those are our six categories. Quick recap before we get into it. Photo, video, gamification assessment, personalized learning and feedback, collaboration, curation, classroom management environment, and lastly, productivity in creativity. That was well done. Thank you. I was pretty proud of that. All right. So before we get into it, just keep in mind, these are all based on a student-centered classroom. We all have the regular uh, G Suite apps. Let's get right into it. Photo video is our first category. These are our selected apps or tools. We have Loom, Gifit, Canva, Imagus, Pablo, and Cultura. All right. So Nick, why don't you start us off because uh, you you chose two in this category. So I guess we should back up. You're getting one from each category. Right. And a utility. So you use your utility on photo video. Right. So each of us got seven picks, one from each category. And then the seventh was kind of like a random one. And I used my seventh random utility pick in this category as well. So first thing I have to mention is a little bit about my overall strategy. When I was thinking about how to make my picks, uh, just like I would imagine you would do in a real draft. You need some type of strategy why you pick certain players to fill certain roles. Well, for me, kind of my big picture idea here was to sort of build like a flipped classroom where uh, my students are watching videos to access content at home so that while we're in class, it frees up time for me to help them and engage them in as much uh, personalized learning as possible. So my first pick, my round one pick, was also within this category, and that is a tech tool known as Loom. Loom is a video recording extension that you can use. It's sort of like an alternative to ones we talk about a lot on the podcast, Screencastify and Screencast-O-Matic. It does pretty much all the same things, just a different way to do that. This is really super important if I'm trying to build a flipped classroom because I need a way to build professional-looking video content to push out to my students. So if that was my overall strategy, I wanted to make sure to grab this one early. That's why it was my round one pick. Um, I started playing around a little bit with Loom too, just to kind of check this out. And I have to say it does some pretty cool stuff. I've always been a Screencast-O-Matic fan, but Loom kind of does all those same things. It does like a little in screen. You can show your face in the bottom corner. This is a minor detail, but I like how Loom puts your face from the webcam in a circle shape rather than a rectangle. I don't know why I like it better. It just looks a little more pleasing. Uh, Loom also has a, this really interesting sort of like a instant commenting feature where as people are viewing your video, 
uh, they can comment on it and you can view those comments in real time. So I haven't really investigated that angle from a teaching perspective, but that could be pretty powerful if I know my students are watching the video during a certain time and they could ask questions while they watch it and I can respond to those questions. So for me, Loom was super important to get right away. And then um, my utility pick also within this round, I actually didn't get this till round four. So this was less important for me. Uh, it's a, an extension called Gifit. Gifit we've talked about recently on the podcast as well. Such a cool thing. It lets you take any YouTube video and just within the screen, within Google Chrome, you can turn that video into a GIF and it lets you kind of trim the components of the video that you want to do that with. Uh, I like this because I, when I make my video content for the students, I try and make them as engaging and professional looking as possible. I want them to kind of know that I put a lot of time and that it looks nice and it's pleasing for them. And one of the main ways I do that is include GIFs in the presentation. So as my video is being recorded, they're seeing as much movement and interest as possible. So for me, GIF it was an important grab as well. So those are my photo selections, guys. I really like the Gifit extension. I, I like that one for multiple reasons. Uh, one thing I found out that students don't really want to watch a nine minute video, but if you could just cut to the chase and do something in 30 seconds or 20 seconds would be even better. That would be a good thing. So that extension was definitely on my radar. So why don't we kick it over to Jeff and Jeff can kind of go over his uh, selection for this category. So I took uh, Imagus or Imagus, I'm not sure. I think I just took it because it sounded like it was from Harry Potter. Um, <laughs> but uh, what happened was um, Geis and uh, Nick both took really good apps from this section in the first round. So at that point, I just decided to toss it and wait until a little bit later. So with my sixth pick, this is why I took Imagus. I, I just thought it was um, convenient for the students and teachers. You know, it just makes it a little bit easier to grab images. You can hover over an image and uh, it'll pull up the um, full size, uh, res full resolution file which makes it a little bit easier for people to uh, download and not have to go through all the uh, the steps of going through Google Images. So I just thought it was a convenient, convenient extension um, just to make life a little bit easier. But again, I didn't take it till my sixth pick because I had prioritized some other categories. So I love that one because anytime that I'm trying to throw a whole bunch of pictures for students to look at into a slides presentation or into a doc or wherever I want to put them, it takes so much time to click on the image because you don't want to look at it as a thumbnail on uh, Google Images. You want to blow it up, make sure it's really exactly what you want. If you pull out a graph, which is what I use it for typically, I want to make sure that the right labels are there and it's a quality graph. That way I'm not showing my students something that I wouldn't want them to recreate. And just using images, Imagus, it just saves you a, a whole bunch of time. So I'm going to go into mine, and mine I think is the monster pick of the category. And just because I'm guessing a lot of people has heard about this one. This is probably one of our well-known ones. If not, it's something that has taken education by storm over the last year or so. And that is Canva. So Canva allows someone like me who is not very, I can't make images look right. Even if I took them off the internet and I want to use them in a flyer, it doesn't look right. So what I'm going to do is I'm going I'm to use Canva to make my posters, brochures, web posts, etc. And it's going to look pretty good. It's going to look fantastic it's for gonna, me. It's going to look really good. Canva's awesome. And a lot of podcasters now have used Canva over Photoshop. And the reason is, is it's very quick, it's efficient, and it will save you a lot of time. So I think students can use this, teachers can use this, and together we can make something that's pretty powerful in the learning atmosphere. So the other thing I like about Canva too is that it's really set up for sharing a lot of time on social media. So it's a really kind of an interesting real life way to spin for projects your students are working on to maybe part of that assignment is to make something they can, uh, an advertisement for say a product that they can put an, advert, an ad for on Instagram Canva makes that super easy. So I did take Canva as my first pick of round one, and I had the third pick. So it did last till third pick, and I was very happy with that. But I would use Canva for my formative and summative assessments. Formative in that they can make a little poster, check for understanding, make a little graph, annotate that graph, check for understanding. But but also summative because it could be part of your e-portfolio. You could easily make things that you can include at the end of an or a, a unit to put into your e-portfolio. So that's 
the reason why I, I picked uh, Canva as my number one pick. I don't know. Canva was your number one. That's interesting. Yeah. Uh, I, I mean, I had three stars next to that one. Right. I was ready to go. As soon as you guys chose your two, I was like out of my seat, and it took me less than a second to announce that one. Nice. All right. So let's go ahead and mention the two that weren't drafted real quick. We, uh, we had Cultura and also Pablo. So Cultura I used in my uh, doctorate courses to do the same thing that Loom Screencastify, Screencast-O-Matic does. It's it's a quality product. It's very easy to use. Uh, I just didn't see a use for it in this in this category because I was so excited about Canva. And Pablo is not as diverse as Canva, but does a lot of the same things. It allows you to put quotes to pictures, pictures to quotes, whatever you want to do, make your classroom look beautiful. I know a lot of people use it to make those quotes that go up there above their whiteboard. Right. W- winning means nothing. Preparation means everything. You know, those types yeah, of Yeah, sure. Quotes. Your little inspirational messages in the classroom. Pablo's good for that. Also just saving images quickly, but I think we have that covered with images from earlier so all right so let's head over to gamification and assessment in this category we have the following ed tech tools gimkit play brighter quizzes the fiscal ship quiz allies virtual nomics class realm and solo learn all right so I'll kick it off with this one. I needed another formative assessment. I'm big on formative assessments. We we have to keep checking where our students are in the student-centered classroom. So I picked a uh, up-and-coming, if not already here, app called GimKit. And this is something that I believe over the next year or two will probably be more popular than Kahoot. And that's a bold statement. I mean, Kahoot is the uh, thing that students always ask for, but now all of a sudden you're starting to hear GimKit its name a little bit more. So the best way to describe it is it's Kahoot, but with more gamification aspects to it. So if you answer questions correctly, if you answer questions correctly, it gives you in-game money, which you can use to purchase in-game advantages. So you want to get the highest score and you're going to have to make some tough decisions. Do I spend $10 of in-game money on a kind of like a point multiplier on the next, over the next three questions, or do I I save that, wait for $30 of in-game money and get a bigger advantage. So really, they're competing against themselves. The students are competing against themselves to try to get a higher score. You could put them on teams. There, there's so many opportunities within this game to really make it more enjoyable. And I've said this before, and I'll say it again. Students are gamers. Everyone in today's world, uh, if you look at the general population, they're gamers. And we have to start teaching to the way that they learn and this is a way to bridge that gap and bring education to gaming an interesting side note for gimkit is that it was actually developed by students and i think that kind of plays into the whole money aspect which is so cool and so unique uh but i think the fact that it was really made by you know by students for students says something a lot those are to us are always uh, the best tech tools you can use made by the people that are going to use it because it really has all the features that you would actually want it to have and i was pretty upset when you chose gimkit because that was going to be one of my picks as well. I, I chose that first pick round two. So I'm I'm going through my early round picks uh, right off the bat, but I was very excited also to get this one. This is another one that I've targeted ever since we made the list. Yeah. Just just a quick aside about GimKid. Uh, last night at dinner, I have a um, ninth grade um, son and daughter, and we were talking about um, Quizlet Live and Kahoot, and they all brought up GimKit, which I didn't really, I wasn't very familiar with, and all three of them said that that was the best. It was way better than Quizlet Live, way better than Kahoot. They All three of them, um, you know, male and female, seventh and ninth grade, extremely enjoyed playing GimKit. So uh, now I regret my pick, and I wish I would have taken that number one <laughs> overall. But <laughs> All right, so let's uh, hop to Nick, and you're going to go over another gamification assessment. Sure. This was one of my my least favorite ones. I was kind of just forced into this only because GimKit and another one of my top choices was taken earlier by someone else. So for round six, right at the end, as my gamification pick, I chose a thing called Play Brighter. Now, Play Brighter does look super cool. It's pretty much just another online online quizzing, online assessment tool that students can use, but it does bring in a lot of the gamification elements that we talk about in a really similar way to GimKit, or maybe even kind of reminds me of a class craft where students uh, can sort of complete missions in this super role-playing, like a role-playing game style scenario. Pretty much as the teacher, you said, 
set out certain questions or groups of questions. They have a question bank also that's over 15,000 questions and growing. Uh, But you set up these questions and those questions comprise the mission. You can sort of tailor what the mission is to depending on what your class is just to kind of bring in some narrative, which I think is another really important piece here. Uh, But pretty much Play Brighter just allows the kids to answer the questions. It's automatically scored. They get their feedback as the teacher. You get the feedback. And uh, the best part about this one is that it is uh, completely free for the uh, for uh, for teachers to to use. So Play Brighter is my gamification pick. Now this is one that I, I really tried to dig deep on some of these categories to bring us some variety and and to bring us some tools that we did not know about prior to this. And Play Brighter, if I didn't get GimKit. I was actually going to take Play Brighter because I think it's up and coming. I, I think it, if they make the right expansions to their already uh, established platform, I think that that could be a great way for students to get some formative assessment. All right, so let's head over to Jeff. And Jeff, you use your utility pick in this category. So why don't we take some time to go over your two selected tools? Okay, with my second overall pick, I took quizzes. Uh, I'm very familiar with Kahoot, and I know it's uh, somewhat similar. Um, Some of the things I like about quizzes is um, it is more self-paced. So for students that take a little bit longer to come up with the answer, um, you know, quizzes is a little more beneficial. It is fun, can be formative. You can use it for instruction. Uh, I usually use it to review, just to prepare kids right before we have an assessment. There are public quizzes available. You can create your own. There's a spot even for um, teachers to leave their own specific feedback. So where Kahoot just tells you if you're right or wrong, uh, teachers can give um, you know customized feedback, which I think is something that could be useful. Uh, we don't have access to Google Classroom in this uh, scenario, but if we did, uh, quizzes can also integrate with Google Classroom. So uh, that's why I went with quizzes with my uh, my second round pick. I think uh, quizzes is is it brings a unique opportunity and sometimes it's not about how quick you answer something and that's one th- aspect of quizzes I like and for some reason during that uh, you were talking integration and I totally forgot that GimKit is and I have to bring this up GimKit will allow you to automatically bring in upload your Quizlet quizzes into GimKit so that's another thing we got to throw out there that brings a little bit more added value to it all right so Jeff you have your utility pick in this category why don't we uh, take some time and this is very special to your craft a little bit, but I play this now. I love this thing. Yeah, so I um, I knew I could wait till the seventh round on this pick because of uh, my content. I, I teach financial literacy, which in the state of New Jersey is required for graduation, which is a separate topic, but that's also great. Uh, fiscal ship, what it is, is um, they want you to take a look at the federal budget and try to put it on a sustainable course. Um, that's the kind of the model there. You can prioritize certain things like cutting taxes, shrinking government, climate change, investing for the future, strengthening our social safety net, et cetera. And you pick your priorities and then they throw you different types of questions and you have to decide um, you know, what's types of policies do you want to um, remove? Which ones do you want to add? You know, which ones do you want to fund more or less? And as you do that, then you take a look at the overall federal budget. And if that gets too high, then you got to figure out where you have to cut. And, um, you know, it's pretty cool. I think it's great, obviously, for my course. But I could also see, you know, now in the middle schools, they're trying to add some uh, financial literacy into social studies. And you know, I think any type of social studies course or, you know, a, a business type course, financial literacy, you know, it's excellent for students to kind of look and see, um, you know, some of the major decisions our government has to make. Before I switched over to Tech Coach, I I was a bioethics teacher and I would definitely use that the fiscal ship in that class because a lot of these policies are environmental and uh, based and I go I went over like water laws and things like that some of the environmental pool things that are in the fiscal ship and I think that would really make students think not only dollars and cents but a lot of times we lose the gap between kind of making an investment in our environment versus taking a shortcut and making more money in our government so we got to take a look at those two things and i think that would be great there so some of these selections that did not get picked in the gamification category were quizalize quizalize just another uh sort of online gaming platform for students to answer questions uh questions in similar to quizzes or some of the others we've mentioned virtunomics which i'm actually super not familiar with i imagine that's another sort of economics themed game i don't know if you guys are lo- know a little bit more about virtunomics uh it, it is a economics themed game and it, it seems 
seemed very interesting to me. I wanted to put it on the list. I think this is one that, you know, maybe Jeff can use in his classroom. So Virtuonomics is a uh, virtual economy fully populated by uh, people and businessmen that the students can play and sort of take the role of as they practice working through some different economic challenges. Classroom, which is a customizable classroom management system, again, built on role-playing themes, sort of similar to some of the other ones that we've mentioned. Also, Solo Learn, nobody picked, which aims to gamify the way that we learn coding. So I don't think anybody just went for the coding option just because we don't deal with that in any of our particular classes, but might be an interesting one for teachers that deal with coding. All right, so next up is collaboration and curation and uh, the tech tools that fit in this category are Zeitboard, Zoom, Verso, Edgenotes, Easy Talks, Explain Everything, and debate graph. And this is where I took my utility and my regular picks. I have two picks in this one, so I will start us off. And because I based my classroom more on the distance learning aspect of things, I had to go ahead and take Zoom. Zoom is by far my favorite online collaboration tool. All right, think Skype, think Hangouts. This one to me is the most user-friendly. It's clean. It's easy to use. Simply go to the site, set up a meeting. It will produce a URL. You share it out to anyone that you want to be in this meeting. They do not need to have the uh, Zoom platform. They don't need to have an account. They could just click on the link, go in as a guest. And then once you're in there, the, the person that sets up the meeting could say, hey, I want Nick to be able to show us our, uh, or whatever's on his computer screen. So maybe he goes through something and that's a great way to collaborate. Now going with that, I have Zeitboard. And Zeitboard is just a virtual whiteboard think of a, a spot where we can all collaborate in real time. So if if I'm the person in Zoom, I could bring up Zeitboard and then I can have a live interactive Zeitboard right there. And because it's on my screen and I can collaborate with everyone else that is a part of that meeting, we can all make changes to that Zeitboard and see that in real time. And that's also a great way to collaborate, run a meeting. And with distance learning, I see the opportunities being endless here. So I want to do something equivalent to Skype a scientist. I know some, my brother-in-law out in California. He's a guy that works on the uh, set of a couple of uh, shows, TV shows. And I know he's a great resource for, you know, one of their anchors and he has a great relationship. Maybe I can get him to bring that guy on our show or better yet, maybe I could bring them into our classroom. So I could use Zeitboard with uh, Zoom and kind of make it a more collaborative. It's an enhanced video conferencing opportunity with both of those mashed up into one. And I took Zeitboard in the fourth round and I took Zoom in the sixth. And once again, I'm very happy with Zoom. That was another one that of my top picks in the category. So I was extremely excited now knowing that I have three of my top picks. I'll say with for Zoom too, anything, I'll use anything that doesn't require me to download or create some kind of a login. And that is Zoom because you just open up the Zoom meeting and just sort of send a link out. You literally click it and you're in. So anything that makes it that simple is a, a tech tool for me also. My collaboration curation pick was actually my round two pick. So I wanted this second most to a video recording software in Loom. Something called Edgenotes, which we've talked about in a recent episode. Edgenotes is just a really super powerful way for students to analyze content that you push to them in the form of a PDF or other documents document. The gist of it is uh, you send out some kind of a document to the kids and they get to edit that in real time. My favorite feature of this is that as the teacher, you can do a turn on this uh, this feature called a heat map. And the heat map shows and you can project this on the screen. That's kind of how I would like to use it. It shows what every student in the whole classroom is doing on the document at that time. So if there's a bunch of kids highlighting the same area, cause it's sort of uh, kind of catching their interest, that will glow like a darker red color. Whereas if there's less students highlighting a certain area that shows up as just yellow. So it kind of lets the whole class see what everybody's focusing on. You can also just sort of like add little emojis to the document and then it lets all the kids see what the what sort of emotions are being experienced as they're looking at something. We've talked about this as being great for editing written 
work and, and sort of commenting on writing style. As a science teacher, I kind of see this as uh, analyzing work that's already been done. Here's a calculation. There's five mistakes in that calculation. See if you can find it. We project it, get a sense of where the class is. Finding those five mistakes opens up the discussion in a big way because now everybody can sort of see where the attention is. They'll have a sense of if they're on the right track or if they're not, even before they open their mouths. And that's why I like it a lot because I think it's going to open up the discussion in the classroom. And if I'm going for a flipped classroom theme, this is the kind of thing that I want going on in the class. The students show up having viewed the content. Now they're going to engage with it. And I think EduNotes is just a really awesome way to do that. So this was an important one for me to get in round two. All right. So Jeff, why don't you go ahead and uh talk about your collaboration curation tool. So I chose uh, Verso. This was my fourth overall pick. You know, initially I liked that it helped teachers with lesson planning and strategies, you know, some of that type of curation and also helped encourage student engagement and, and their collaboration also. But then as I looked into a little deeper, the thing I liked most probably was that connected students, they can interact anonymously, which I thought was kind of important. Sometimes when students work together, um, face-to-face even, um, you know, you get a dominant student and then a passive student. And this, by making them, by allowing them to work anonymously, hopefully you get the kids that are a little bit quieter, um, can get involved a little bit more. And then as an aside, because I am a technology coach, it does look like it could be a great resource for teacher PD, get a lot of collaboration among staff, uh, offering a lot of content. So I thought that could be something that, um, you know, may not, I mean, I could use it in the classroom, but they can also use it outside of the classroom with the other part of my position. All right. So there you have it. There's our collaboration, curation tools, everything ed tech there. Uh, the ones that were not selected in this group were Easy Talks, which is another uh, tool, kind of like Zoom, Skype, and all that explain everything and debate graph so Nick I know you have seen a little bit or you've worked a little bit with explain everything and debate graph can you uh, just tell us a little bit about those sure so explain everything is just another good sort of collaborative learning environment where teachers and students can sort of share their ideas at the same time collectively in a way that doesn't require them to be face to face if they're not in the classroom or if there's a big group working together also debate graph it's a really popular web platform that sort of helps you visualize a network of thought, which is hard to describe, but it sort of shows in a visual way different ways to reason out uh, sort of what you're thinking and, and describe that visually. So it's a little bit easier for a group to understand. Debate graph is definitely interesting to check out if you're trying to run a classroom debate or a discussion where students are trying to work through maybe differing opinions and you need a visual aid to help with that. So those are the ones that did not get picked in collaboration. You can follow Got Tech outside the podcast at gottech.com or on Twitter at We Got Tech. All right, so it's time to go into our next category, which is personalized learning and feedback. The EdTech tools for this category include Google Keep, Talk and Comment, Guru, Checkmark, and Kaizena. So, uh, Jeff, why don't you start us off with your pick? So, this was uh, pick 1-1, one, one, the number one overall pick in the draft. And um, while I have a lot of experience with drafting fantasy sports, I'm uh, not as good as these uh, tech ed experts with Nick and uh, Geis. So, I, I played it safe. I played it safe with the 1-1 one, one pick, and I went with Google Keep. It's something I'm familiar with. It's something I know uh, works pretty well in this environment. Uh, it's real good for adding comment comments when you're grading papers. Uh, you can use it for sticky notes and to-do lists and those kinds of things, both for teachers and for students to kind of help them stay organized, you just jot down ideas. Is. Um, got a Chrome extension so you can bookmark, bookmark sites for class. Uh, it works real well on your phone, your Chromebook, or your uh, laptop, whatever environment you're in. So I just knew it was a jack of all trades. It's probably not the best item on the board, but I wanted to make sure I played it safe. Um, they say you can't uh, necessarily win your draft in the first round, but you definitely can lose it. So I didn't want to take any risks. Uh, that's smart. I will say I want to add one thing to that. Uh, we had a conversation with a teacher the other day who said, I really like to put stickers at the top of the paper. So if I grade online and you could take pictures and make them into stickers, you can make uh, you could turn emojis into stickers. You're, if you use your uh, Bitmoji, you could turn that into a sticker. So that's easy to drag in as well. Do GIFs work? Could you put a GIF in Google Keep and then they get like a moving sticker? I bet it would, right? Because it's I, just- I would, I would assume so, yeah. It's just an image, so I would say that would work as well. And that would be a uh, kind of a neat upgrade to the, the regular sticker. Yeah, it's like a Harry Potter sticker that actually has like some movement right in it, so that's like a more advanced version, so that sounds pretty cool. All right, Nick, you're up next, so why don't you go over your tech tool. Sure. This was my round three pick. This was definitely one that I wanted pretty early on just because if my overall theme is trying to do like a flipped classroom design, I definitely want to incorporate as much technological 
assignments in as many technological ways to give feedback on those assignments as possible. So this really for me has to do with student feedback and my favorite way to do that is with an extension called Talk and Comment. We've talked about it many times on the podcast before but it keeps coming up because it's one of the best ones I think. Uh, what it allows you to do is actually record your voice as a comment that then gets embedded uh, in the form of a link at, uh, in a Google Doc that a student has submitted as an, as, as an assignment. So uh, the reason I like it is because it allows you to sort of maintain some some level of personalization that you sort of tend to lose when you're giving electronic feedback. But in this case, it's actually your voice and the students can listen to it, they can hear your tone, you can kind of use the, the rapport that you've developed with your class. And I think it's just a nicer way for kids to hear cr critiques from a teacher. Uh, so talk and comment for me is going to be big. Personalized feedback while keeping the ability to give uh, fast and keeping the speed that the technological feedback allows. So that was a big one for me. I think that one's very, very uh, cool because not only does it work in G Suite, you could plug it right into Gmail. You could also put it onto Twitter. Anything that accepts a URL, you can use talk and comment with. Right, because it just records your voice in the form of a link. So you can, like I said, you can kind of put it anywhere. So any any way you want to give feedback to kids doesn't have to be embedded. Uh, whatever LMS your school uses, however you push feedback to them, just include the link that talk and comment generates and they'll, they'll have their response. I really like the point you made about the tone, though. I think that's important, you know, because a lot of kids with constructive criticism, they don't always take it the way you want them to. So if you can, you know, you speak into it, you can give them the tone, you can be encouraging, you know, and they know you, they hear your voice. It's a little bit better than black and white, I think, sometimes. Absolutely. All right, so I'm going to go with mine. And this was a lot of times at the end of a fantasy draft, I like to take some risks. And after doing a little bit of homework and knowing that uh, my tech tool, which is Guru, G-O-O-R-U, I found out that it's supported by Google. So I was like, okay, this has to be a safe tool. And after doing some further research, it fits along with the student-centered and personalized learning theme that I was going for because it allows you to look at a student's starting point and keep measuring their progress throughout the year. So you get their starting point, their ending point, and it gives you statistics that way. It also allows you to hold resources in there that students can access. So it shows student progress um, compared to where they started to to where they ended over a long period of time. And we could talk grade levels here. So you could see a standard from second to fourth to sixth to eighth to a senior, and you could see how they improved on that standard over that you know long period of time. Of course, that's if other teachers use this program. So that is the downside. But even if it's a, you know, tracking a student from the beginning of the year to the end of the year, I think I would use that and that would be pretty cool. So those are the three that went in the personalized learning and feedback category. The ones that didn't get picked are actually two of my favorites, uh, which is Checkmark and Kaizena. And we got to say that, you know, those would have been safe picks. But depending where we were in our draft, we had other reasons for, I think, uh, both Jeff and Nick got amazingly proven uh, tools, and I took a little bit of a risk with my seventh pick. Yeah, so Checkmark and Kaizena, I just want to add in here before we leave this category, they do really similar things to uh, my selection, Talk and Comment. I only went with Talk and Comment because of the voice feature, but uh, if you've not heard of Checkmark or Kaizena before, those are really just, and correct me if I'm wrong, but you're pretty much just doing canned comments here within the Google Docs. So you highlight text and a bunch of, a little dialog box kind of pops up and it lets you kind of throw in a comment that you've sort of pre-set up uh, as like a, like I said, a canned comment. And then you can kind of really quickly push that to the kids without having to type it over and over a thousand times. Uh, but those are also great options for electronic feedback. I like Checkmark a lot too. It does it does what it does better than Google Keep does. Google Keep just does a few more things. So that's why I went with that. Um, you know, had I had the option of an unlimited number of uh, players on my fantasy team here, I would have taken Checkmark to do the commenting. But I decided, you know, Google Keep's a little bit more of a jack all trades. Makes sense. Kaizena does allow voice comments. Right. It does, yeah. uh, and it also does the text comments as well. So that one is there. I, I, I like the setup of both. Either one I would use, depending on uh, what assignment that I was looking at, but both quality uh, ed tech tools. Let's go into classroom management and environment. Now, really, this is anything from... LMS is to something that's going to control your classroom. And these are the uh, ed tech tools for this category. And we had a lot here. Classroom Q, which is one of our uh, podcast favorites. Teachers IO, Pen Pal Schools, Classcraft, which is another podcast favorite. Wheel Decide, that's wheel, 
W-H-E-E-L, decide, and Flippity. So these are classroom management and environment. And Nick, why don't you start us off? So this was my round seven pick, and I didn't intend it to be, but I went with Classroom Q from this category. I thought for sure Classroom Q would kind of get snatched up by somebody else earlier on, uh, just because of how powerful I think it can be in terms of classroom management, and so it's sort of making things run more smoothly. But round seven kind of rolled around, and it was still there, so I grabbed it, even though it wasn't on my original list. Classroom Q, if you're not familiar we talked about it a few episodes back with a guest Kyle Nemus who's actually one of the developers of the program the whole concept is imagine being in a classroom where everybody's working on stuff but the students are at a particularly challenging point maybe there's a lot of questions where you've got seven different hands raised kids are calling out your name and you're just trying to run around and make sure you get to everybody uh, it can be stressful this also inevitably leads to certain students that are sort of sitting there with, with their hand raised but you're helping another five kids that just happen to be closer to your physical location location so they kind of get tired of waiting and they put their hand down they make a guess they move on and they don't get the help that they need with classroom Q, it kind of takes away some of that stress where students have a on on a screen and it works with a cell phone or a chromebook or whatever um, a screen that they have pulled up just a little red button uh, in place of raising their hand and having to hold it there and wait for you they just click the red button and they're added into the classroom queue for that lesson which means they're just in this digital line and then as the teacher you can see uh, the list of students who have tap the red button and you can sort of make your way around to them systematically kind of takes the pressure off the kids because they know as soon as they hit that red button you're going to get to them eventually they don't have to raise their hand and keep it raised if you're super busy and it kind of just ensures that you don't lose track of anybody again i love this because in my flipped classroom uh, the kids are going to be coming in and pretty much just working on stuff so i'm going to be doing a lot of just responding to questions and if they can let me know that they need help this way. I think it's probably the smoothest way to run things. So this was a late pick for me, but it turned out to be a really important one. All right, so I'm going to take the next one, and I would have probably selected in Classroom Q, but I was going for the distance learning theme, and there's one tech tool called Pen Pal Schools that I was really targeting here. So in Pen Pal Schools, teachers can use this site to provide distance learning opportunities with other classes around the world. So it pairs you up with classes that want to participate in this kind of like new age version of pen pals but it's digital and you can you can uh, get on the platform and set up a, a virtual meeting there so i use pen pal schools and that was my fifth pick off the board and i was very happy with it because it just fit the theme that i was going for yeah that sounds uh perfect we didn't we talked about uh, something called uh, like a digital pen pal a while back in a previous episode and at that time pen pal schools didn't come up so it's pretty exciting there's a feature pretty much directly for that and helping teachers to sort of coordinate these pen pals yeah it was pretty good so uh jeff go ahead so for my uh, classroom management environment i chose teachers io uh took it with my third pick i had second third pick back to back so those those didn't really matter the order um i just know it was really important uh, here in, at our school we helped develop an LMS to go along with our SIS and gradebook and all those other things. And uh, the LMS means a lot to me because I've seen kids, I have my own kids are, you know, middle school age and uh, organization is just tough. It's tough for kids. I, I don't like it when kids don't complete work because they don't know where it is. They can't find it. They don't know what they need to do next. So I really want to try to help them organize themselves. It's been kind of a pattern for some of my other picks. And uh, with Teachers IO, they've got a calendar interface. It's really straightforward. Uh, it's easy for students to follow. The integrated app is really good. I think a lot of times kids go home and it's quicker and easier for them to check their phone real quick to see what they have to do not as, as opposed to opening up the Chromebook or the laptop or whatever else they have. So I just like the interface. I like that it stays organized. Organized. Um, you know, you can have tests, you can copy tests over from one semester to another, and it just makes things a little bit easier for the teacher and a lot easier for the students so they know what's going on. Yeah. So, I mean, I think that one's amazing because not only does the teacher get organized, but there's an opportunity for the students to see that in a calendar form as well. And they, they'd be able to download those uh, different documents. So I think that's really important especially since this uh challenge this fantasy draft we did not get google classroom we do not have any type of uh, lms there i think this is the best of both worlds it gets both the teachers and the students involved so the ones that did not get picked were class craft wheel decide and flippity and i could tell you that all three of us around the table would agree that class craft is amazing and we've talked about it several times but i think that's one of the reasons why we didn't pick it here just because we're trying to get the things that we don't see every day so our goal is to try to explain expose you guys to something that you might be able to use that you never heard of before. So let's go on to our last category, which is productivity and creativity. And this is one of my favorites. Here are the tech tools. We have Click and Clean. We have Colorzilla, 
Nimbus, Extensity, Incredibox, Picture in Picture, Just Read, Tab Resize, and Doc Secrets. And I will throw this out there as I kind of made this list. I put Extensity on there, but if we don't have any extensions, Extensity really shouldn't be on the list, but we wanted to throw it out there. It allows you to turn on and off your extensions. Very easy, just one click and you know, that will help keep your computer running faster and it won't uh, slow down, bog down your computer. But we wanted to throw that one out there. But Jeff, why don't you get us started in this category with uh, your pick? So this was by far the most unique category. Um, a lot of other categories had some overlap and this category did not have any overlap that I could tell from all the different products. Uh, I just went with Click and Clean uh, as somebody that helps students with their uh, technology issues. I know a lot of times it's just a matter of cleaning the, clearing the cache. That's an issue we have with our uh, SIS LMS that we use in my building. And uh, the click and clean just seems a really easy way for students, teachers to try to troubleshoot the Chromebook very quickly. If that doesn't work, then obviously they can try to, uh, you know, go go get a little bit extra help. So I went with click and clean because I know that would help me right now with my current position. And I thought it'd be something good for students. Okay, click and clean sounds like a really cool choice. And I, I like how Jeff kind of pointed out how varied this uh, particular category was. So many cool things to choose from. For me, I had to choose... Colorzilla, which is a unique thing and it's really super specific to my overall vision for uh, the team I'm putting together here. But like I've t just talked about, I'm flipping my classroom with these choices in the draft. So part of that, of course, is me making my own video content. I'm really super picky about the stuff I'm going to have my kids view in order to gain access to information, um, which pretty much means I don't like a lot of what's out there on YouTube already. I find that it's either too challenging or not challenging enough, or it just has a lot of details that I don't care about and aren't important for my class. So usually what this ends up resulting in is I make a lot of my own content. And this usually comes in the form of some kind of a video that I've screencasted using Screencast-O-Matic or in, in this case, uh, my new choice, Loom. But a big part of that when I make the videos, I want them to look as professional and, and nice as possible. I don't want my students to see the video and think that this is something I just threw together using whatever old PowerPoint I had sitting around from the past, more of a lecture-based thing. I wanted to seem, I like when they know that I put a lot of time into it. I like when it looks good. I like when it looks quality. I like when it looks professional. One, because it's out there on YouTube publicly with my name. Two, I just think it sets a good precedent and a good model. And I think it helps the kids kind of stay interested if they're looking at something that is, well, that, that shows that there's some time and quality put in there. Colorzilla for me is going to be a big part of that. Really what this allows you to do, it's just a color editing extension. So you can download it for Chrome as an extension. And um, it's pretty much just a really super fancy eyedropper tool. If anybody's ever uh, used the eyedropper tool in like a word processing doc, really it just lets you select any other color on the screen and suck that color up in the digital eyedropper and then apply that color to any other shape you want. Uh, for me, as I create my digital video content, this is really important just for continuity from frame to frame. If there's a color in a certain picture that's in the video that I want to replicate in a bunch of other slides, Colorzilla is a way that I can make sure that everything matches is and I get that sort of professional quality look that I'm going for. It does a lot of other fancy stuff too, that if you're really into this type of thing, you can use like a color picker eyedropper gradient generator. So if you've got like a certain color red that you wanna use as maybe a theme in a video, uh, it shows you a whole variations of that exact color red from light to dark, uh, as well as a lot of other more advanced tools that I haven't gotten a chance to figure out yet. But anybody who's interested in sort of this, the almost the graphic design component, of creating this digital content. Uh, for me, Colorzilla is gonna be a fun thing to play around with. Colorzilla is awesome. Uh, but I thought that my Canva can do the same type of thing. But one thing I realized, and I, I use the snipping tool on my computer a lot. Yes. I use it to do a lot of things. And there's another thing link out there allows me to annotate pictures a way that I want to do it. I wanted to find something that kind of fit that void uh, in my uh, tech tool lineup here. So I went with Nimbus, which is another extension. And it's like the snipping tool, but on steroids. Right, it allows you to do a lot. You can take any part of a web page. If you want to take a snapshot of the whole web page, you can do that. Uh, you could take a, a portion of the web page and, and use it just like the snipping tool. But one thing I like about this, and this is where the snipping tool kind of lacks, is that if you have something that is a scrolling list, this will allow you to take a screenshot of that scrolling list which I think is pretty cool. Another thing is I like to post 
pictures of what my students that I'm working with are doing. And a lot of times, some of the kids aren't on the release form for posting public pictures. So Nimbus also has a blur out tool, which allows you to blur out student faces. So everyone still gets what they're doing in the classroom, but now it also keeps their privacy. So Nimbus allows you to snip, edit, save, Saving to your Google Drive, saving to your hard drive is super easy. Anything from a web page or anywhere on your computer screen. So I'm going to say this right now. I think this is going to be the most used tool out of all of mine. And I think it's it's really going to tie everything together because I'm thinking I'll snip little pictures or sayings or quotes or something like that straight to my Zite board, which I will use in Zoom. And maybe I will use it while using the Pen Pal Schools app. So I, I could use all these together just to fulfill my vision. One quick comment about, um, about Nimbus though. Um, if you're out there and you're just using regular print screen and then you're putting it in uh, paint and then cropping it and then putting it somewhere else, you know, you really miss the boat. The, the snipping tool I thought was great and then Windows upgraded it and uh, and I thought the new version was great and then when uh, Geist told me about Nimbus I figured ah, it's no big deal it can't be as good as the newer snipping tool and it is it really is a lot better it's just great to be able to do everything all in one application uh, it makes a big difference so if you're not using any of these tools you're, you're really missing out and, and Nimbus you should give it a shot because just being able to do it all in one one place is, is a huge advantage you get a, you can get a lot done absolutely so let's go over the ones that did not get picked here we already went over Extensity but Incredibox one of my all time favorites it's a, it, it's a musical beatbox program that you could download these perfectly in sync beats and you could put them to the back end of projects. Picture in picture, just read tab resize doc secrets. Anything to say about those four? Uh, I, I just want to say that Incredibox is one of my favorite things, not so much from the teacher side, but more from the student side. It's just a really quick, easy, fun way to have to be able to generate a, a beat, really, with a, a tons of different variety. It's super easy and super cool. I think uh, Tab Scissors and Tab Glue might be the extensions I've been using the longest since I've been on Chrome, and um, being able to do them together in the tab resize, um, that that's, a, again, a big bonus. You get a lot more flexibility. So I went from you know using a, a less complicated uh, bit of uh, software to something that can do a lot more. So this was a very a great learning experience for me. Well, there you have it. We went through 41 different tools. We each drafted seven, giving us a total of 21, and all the other ones are in our drafting pool if we wanted to add and drop later on if we played this thing out. so I just want to say that I think I clearly have the, the winning team at the end of all this, at least as far as a cohesive choice of choosing Loom to record my videos and then all the other selections from edge notes to talk and comment to classroom cue for the the management of my class when the students are in there i don't know if you guys can come close to what i've got put together here just saying i don't want to make myself the winner but i've got a pretty strong strong selection uh i think you're throwing some spitballs across <laughs> the table that you're not going to be able to back up because personally you want to talk about cohesion i just told you how i could use every single one of my apps all for a nice well-rounded product for the students in a student-centered and personalized classroom uh, i don't think any other i as I go down here, I got my first pick in each category, four out of the six categories. So for me, I, I feel like that's hard to beat. Canva, that's the best photo editing creativity piece there. Uh, we got GimKit. I think that's one of our gamification things that are challenging Kahoot for the top spot. I think the most productive tool out there is Nimbus because it's of its versatility. Zightboard, I'm just excited because it plays well with Zoom, which is another one, and Zightboard, and that makes that an unstoppable package. And Guru, I'm still looking at it. I'm still trying to figure it out, but I will tell you this, being able to monitor progress, student progress, is super important in that personalized learning classroom. So I'll give you the award then for most cohesive selections. You, you got a point, especially with Nimbus, but I'm still going to take the, the award for uh, best flipped classroom selections because I don't think you can beat what I have put together there for those. And just looking back at Jeff's, you, I think you have some of the most uh, common sense selections as far as productivity and just making life easy on a teacher. I'm not sure if that's kind of why you chose those, but it's something that jumped out. Th yes, that's pretty much where I was going. I was all set to say some nice things about both of you. I, the one thing I will say, I know why Nick chose talk and comment based on uh, his uh, his little bragging over there, but um, yeah, I think uh, I think Loom I think Loom really looks like it might be one of the best picks overall. Maybe I should have gone with that over overall number one. Uh, I like Geis's uh, pick of Gimkit. I think that's something that uh, you know I, I probably could have uh, could help my gamification just a little bit more. And then for me personally, because I do teach uh, financial literacy, the virtual economics um, probably would have been a good 
pick for me too. I did go with the fiscal ship. I thought they kind of um, were very similar. So those are you know just some of my thoughts that maybe I could have done differently now I've gone through the experience. So remember to check out the recommendations page on gottech.com so you can see the full list of 41 selections and really get a feel for all of these choices that we put together for the draft, not just our official selections and really investigate. Of course, in that list, we'll have all the links for easy access to all of these selections as well to really help you get started using some of these tech tools. And another thing, because everything is a competition between me and uh, Nick over there, and we have Jeff here, who I think is also better than Nick uh, <laughs> in selecting uh, ed tech tools. What I would like you to do is uh, go over the Twitter and just uh, use the hashtag got tech, G-O-T-T-E-C H-E-D, and let us know who won. I know that Nick is going to get one because Kyle is going to vote for you. Yes, he will. So we'll spot you one because I, f- I feel like that's cheating. But uh, uh, I think uh, it's going to be on the other side of the table is going to be the winner out of this. But we'll see. That could be. Yeah, Jeff definitely has some of the stronger choices here. As the rookie here, I'm just happy to be here. So just a great experience. And I just hope I don't get sent down to the minors. So there you have it. You have Nick over there who's very cocky and confident that he won. You have Jeff playing the good guy rookie card. Even though I feel like we're we're ganging up on Nick, I, I still feel that uh, Jeff and I are, are going to be victorious in this. So until next time, make sure that you check us out on Twitter at WeGotTech or on our webpage at www.gottech.com.